as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, St. Peter writes, as of the power which God administereth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today's saint, Augustine of Canterbury, converted England, but almost didn't. He was a Benedictine monk and sent off with a group of 40 monks from Rome, but he almost turned back out of fear. The French, you see, had filled their ears with fables about the ferocity of the English. But Gregory the Great, when Augustine returned wanting to scrap the mission, chuffed up the courage of this otherwise good monk, and finally they arrived, and it was some 1,511 years ago, and he converted the English. He met the pagan king, Ethelbert, and Ethelbert, for his part, he was afraid as well, and he only agreed to meet the band of missionaries outdoors under an oak tree, thinking their monk magic would be diluted if it were not being administered in a building under a roof. And so the little band made a procession led by a silver cross carrying a beautiful picture of our Lord they had brought from Rome with them and singing something from the greater litanies we still do today in April. Ethelbert was soon converted, and England, for all its faults, was won for Christ bloodlessly, the same as Ireland. And Ethelbert, because of fear beforehand, he gave way to what sin? That's the sin of superstition. Superstitious people are timorous. Their lives are governed by fear and all sorts of rules they've made up for themselves. Augustine, despite his fears, went forward bravely with his sacramentals, his cross, his holy picture, and the sacred chant, which calmed him and his missionaries, and he conquered in Christ's name. Now, the king was guilty of superstition because he ascribed to created things some power they do not possess. Superstition and unbelief, they go hand in hand. But the bishop put his confidence in the cross of Christ and in that icon of our Lord and the sacred chant because of the power they possess. Sacramentals usually work by inspiring us with interior acts of faith and of devotion. But some sacramentals in particular, and all of them that are blessed in general, possess in and of themselves a power. And we believe that as Catholics because God has so established it, and the church has confirmed it. And this is no superstition. And I want to tell you a tale today about a very power, powerful, indeed a, a miraculous sacramental you've all heard of before. I've been wanting to tell you the story for the longest time, and I thought I must get it in now before the end of Mary's month of May. It's a story about a, a black man, young, un, uneducated, who in the 1940s was executed for murder in Mississippi. Now this man is named Claude Newman. He knew nothing at all about religion, never been baptized. He knew there was a God, everybody does, but more than that, that our Lord is the Son of God, or about the church, no or Mary, certainly not. He couldn't read or write. The only way he knew which way a book should go would be if he looked at the pictures. 
Well, there he was in prison awaiting execution, and he shared his death row cell block with four other prisoners. And one night, the five of them were sitting around talking, and eventually the conversation ran out, and Claude, noticing something around the neck of one of the other boys, asked him what it was. The boy was Catholic. It was a miraculous medal, but he didn't know how to explain it to somebody else. And he got frustrated, and then in his anger, he whipped it off and he threw it on the floor with a curse. Take the thing, he said. Now, Claude had no idea what it was, that it was any different from a medal, but somehow he felt drawn to it, what he thought was maybe just a trinket. And he wanted to wear it, and he put it on right away. And he wore it that night in bed. As he was sleeping, he felt a light touch on his wrist. He opened his eyes, and he saw what he described later to the chaplain as the most beautiful woman God had ever created. At first he was frightened, but the lady calmed him and said, if you would like me to be your mother, and you would like to be my child, send for a priest of the Catholic Church. And with these words, she disappeared. Claude cried out for a guard that he had seen a ghost. And the next thing he said, I must see a priest. Well, there was a priest nearby. He was a divine word father, a Father Robert O'Leary, a missionary there in Mississippi. And he came the next day, and Claude told him exactly what he had seen. And the father asked him then, well, do you want to study to be a Catholic? And he did. So he started visiting regularly and conducting catechism classes for all five of those condemned prisoners. Several weeks passed, and one week, father announced that they'd be studying the sacrament of penance. Father had just begun his lesson when Claude blurted out, oh, I know about that. The lady told me that when we go to confession, we are kneeling down not before a priest, but we're kneeling down by the cross of her son. And that when we are truly sorry for our sins and we confess them, the blood he shed flows down over us and washes us free of our sins. Well, Father took that in and his jaw was open. He couldn't believe the words he was hearing. This fellow had never even been baptized and knew nothing at all about religion. He had given such a beautiful little catechism class about confession. And Claude thought the priest was angry because he interrupted his lesson. And he said, oh, Father, please don't, don't be angry. I didn't mean to speak out of turn. And then he said, I'm not angry, Claude, but did that lady come to you again? And then Claude paused, and then he said, Father, can I talk to you over there? And they went to a corner of the cell block, and he said, she told me that if you doubted me or hesitated, I was to remind you about that time you were lying in the ditch in Holland in 1940, and you made a vow that she's still waiting for you to keep. He was a chaplain in World War II, and he was in a ditch in Holland, and he almost died, and he promised Our Lady, if he survived, that he would build her a church in honor of her immaculate conception, and nobody knew about that, except for Mary and Father O'Leary, and now Claude. He returned to the catechism class. As best he could, Father continued his lesson, and Claude at this point kept on interrupting, sort of urging the other fellows and saying, you shouldn't be afraid to go to confession. You're really telling God your sins, not the priest. And then the most original illustration, he said, you know, the lady said that confession is something like a telephone. 
we talk through the priest to God, and God talks back to us through the priest. About a week later, they'd come to Holy Communion, and Claude indicated, well, he, he had learned something about that too from the lady. And he said, the lady told me that in communion, I will only see what looks like a piece of bread. But she told me that it really is truly her son and that he will be with me just as he was with her before he was born in Bethlehem. She told me I should spend my time before communion like she did during her lifetime with Jesus in loving him, adoring him, thanking him, praising him, and asking him for blessings. And I shouldn't be distracted or bothered by anybody or anything else, but I should spend those few minutes in my thoughts alone with him. As the weeks progressed, they finished their catechism. Claude and the other prisoners were baptized, and the date for his execution, January 1944, came up, and, and the, as the custom is, he was asked by one of the officials if he had a final request or a final meal that he wanted. And he said, well, all of my friends are very shook up, and the jailer here, he's shook up too. But you see, you all don't understand. I'm not going to die, only my body. I'm going to be with her. So then, I would like to have a party. A party, he said. Yes, a party. And they arranged a party. Father O'Leary got a, one of his parishioners to donate the cake and the ice cream, and everybody on the second floor gathered together, and they had a party. And then, leave it to the priest, he thought, all these people, holy hour. So when they finished the end of the last of the cake and the ice cream, they all knelt down, and they made a nice holy hour, including Stations of the Cross, together. The time passed quickly. The date, the hour of his execution approached. He was just on his way to the electric chair when somebody, as in a movie, runs in to the scene and says, two-week reprieve has been given by the governor for Claude Newman. Claude stopped in his tracks, and he started to cry. Now, they presumed those were tears of joy. But that would have been wrong. You don't understand, he says. If you ever saw her face, if you ever looked into her eyes, you would not want to live another day. And so then he continued, what have I done wrong, Father? Because the priest was there by state law back then. You had to have a clergyman at the execution. Father Larry was right there and said, Father, what have I done wrong that I can't go home and see the lady? Well, Claude, Father explained, God has his ways and there's some good purpose that you're still meant to accomplish. And after all, it's only a two-week reprieve. And so it was. Father had a sudden inspiration. He said, what about that other prisoner? Everybody in the prison knew him. His name was James Hughes. He was a white prisoner who had committed terrible crimes against his own children, and then finally murder. He had been raised a Catholic, but he hated the faith. He would spit and curse if anyone so much as intoned a prayer in his presence. Maybe, Claude, maybe Our Lady wants you to offer this denial of being with her for his conversion. Claude accepted that. Father showed him the words to say, and he made a prayer for a little consecration. And just two weeks after all passed very quickly, the man, this James Hughes, hated him even more viciously than before, but never mind. He went to his death with great peace. The chaplain, Father O'Leary, testified, I've never seen anybody go so joyfully to the electric chair. Even the reporters that were there were amazed. How could anyone go and sit there beaming with happiness? But so he did. And just before he died, 
he said to Father, Father, I will remember you, and whenever you have a request, ask me, and I'll ask her. That's the Catholic doctrine of mediation and intercession, isn't it? Oh, and the other prisoner, the fallen away? Well, that's the rest of the tale. That will be for another day. But I wanted to tell you today about the manifold grace of God in this little, little sacramental, the miraculous medal, a tremendous power. That man didn't even know anything about anything, but he put the medal on, and Mary, who is the best steward of all, of the manifold grace of God. She did the rest. Do you need one? I've got some blessed ones there at the little shrine and then again at Our Lady's altar. Don't take one just to take one. But if you'd like one, if you need one, or if you know someone to whom you could give it with some hope, do that. And Our Lady, she may just do the rest. God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.